So uh, good evening, everyone. And I just want to thank you all for joining us tonight. I know you're probably all just very busy and it's a very strange and turbulent time in our country right now. So I'm, I'm glad you, you made the time to come be with us. Uh, my name is Greg Kanan and I am a RISD grad. I graduated in 2002 from the FAB department and I'm a lawyer. And uh, believe it or not, <laughs> there's about 30 RISD alums who went on to careers in the legal, uh, the legal world, and uh, including myself and everyone you see on this panel. Um, and so the RISD alumni office asked us, uh, my group, the, or our group, the RISD Lawyers Affinity Group, uh, to put on this event to talk about um, our careers and what it took to become lawyers and what drew us down that path. And, um, you know, we're going to talk about our current world and, um, you know, maybe a little bit about what the future looks like, uh, given the current pandemic. Um, believe it or not, uh, there are a number of uh, people who are uh, RISD grads who are RISD students and RISD grads who are interested in becoming lawyers. I've spoken to a number of them myself, about half a dozen of them just, just in the past year who are interested in pursuing careers in law and public policy. Um, so we're gonna talk about that tonight. Um, uh, one of the things we're, <laughs> this is not gonna be is a, like a legal seminar. We're not gonna be uh, dispensing legal advice. Um, if you do have specific questions about legal issues you're facing, um, I'm gonna provide my email at the end of this uh, webinar so you can email me directly and I'll point you in the, in the direction of the appropriate resource. Um, I also want to ask everyone uh, who's on the panel and everyone who's watching uh, to do two things at some point in the near future if you haven't. Uh, RISD has a new alumni website uh, where you can go and submit, you know, you, you know, submit uh, things that projects you've worked on or things that you'd like other RISD grads to know about. It's a great tool for for letting everyone know what you're up to these days. Um, and I'd also like you to um, go sign up and, get, and make a profile at the new RISD network page. Um, it's, a, it's a social networking tool for RISD grads, uh, RISD students and RISD grads. Um, and I've communicated with a number of students through that uh, platform and it's been great. So I recommend that. Um, I'm gonna ask everyone on the panel to introduce themselves in a moment, but I think since I'm moderating tonight, I should start with myself. So again, my name is Greg Kanan. I graduated from FAV in 2002. Uh, from 2002 to 2009, I was a television documentary producer and I produced a number of things for the Discovery Channel, Core TV, um, A&E, TLC. Uh, and then for reasons that we, we will get into <laughs> later on tonight, um, I decided to go to law school. I went to law school at Northeastern University in Boston. Um, by day, I actually have two jobs. By day, I am a civil rights investigator and attorney at uh, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development in their Fair Housing Office, so I focus on civil rights uh, during the day. And at night, I actually have uh, a part-time solo law practice that focuses on issues uh, that artists, designers, filmmakers face. So intellectual property, business formation, contracts, things of that nature. Um, Emmanuel, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Emmanuel Maleon. I uh, graduated from RISD with, um, from painting in 2012. I have been a lawyer for about two years. I went to UCLA uh, Law School in Los Angeles. Um, and yeah, I, I'm currently working at the policing project at NYU's law school. Um, and prior to that, I was a fellow with the Liberty and National Security Program at the Brennan Center for Justice, which is also housed at NYU's law school. Um, I work on issues of, uh, in, in that prior role, it was, uh, it was domestic terrorism, um, hate crimes, and sort of the ways that race interplays with those, those two issues. And then in my current role, I'm working on technology and policing. And um, it, I wish it wasn't so relevant now, but it is. So it's uh, nice to be here with everybody. All right, thank you. Victoria, how about you? Hello, I'm Victoria Rosner. I graduated from RISD in 2007. I majored in photography. Uh, after I graduated, I moved home to New York. And for about a year, I um, tried to be an artist in New York. I went to galleries. I had um, fun with my friends. I made work. 
And then I started law school in 2009. I graduated in 2011 from New York Law School in New York. Um, after that, I briefly worked as a criminal prosecutor. And now I work for the appellate court in Brooklyn. Um, it's a middle appellate court. And basically what I do is I work for the judges. So when an appeal is filed in the court, a clear example of that is after um, somebody might be convicted of a crime, they might want to appeal their conviction. And that's the court that I work at. Um, and I go through the record, I go through the issues on the appeal, and I write research reports for the judges explaining what happened and making recommendations as to what should happen. I've been doing that since. <laughs> Great. Jonathan, last but not least. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us here. My name is Jonathan Rosenblum. I graduated from RISD in and graduated in architecture in um, 19 and um, uh, had a, uh, went right into law school right from there because I knew I wanted to practice civil rights law, which is what I did for about four years, mostly police brutality cases. Um, some of the stuff is relevant today, but there was two decades ago that I was doing that work because um, I realized that I missed the uh, stuff that I love about architecture, the land and getting back to the, the trees and the earth. So I switched over to land use law and environmental law uh, quite a while ago and did that for the federal government, for a large law firm. Ultimately went back to school one, for more, one more year uh, at Harvard to get an LLM focusing on local sustainability and land use uh, and then started teaching uh, law school same thing, local government, uh, sustainability, environmental issues, and land use about 10 years ago. First at Drake University in Des Moines, and now I'm at Vermont Law School, where I started uh, last year. Great. Uh, a, a lot of you have very relevant uh, experience to what's going on in the world today, so I think we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, I'm going to start throwing out questions to the panel in just a moment, but I do want to just uh, let everyone who's listening in know that um, I'm going to... We're going to go through our questions um, and our discussion. If you do have a question for the panelists, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can ask those questions there. I'm not going to ask your questions to the panel until we get to the end, but um, rest assured that that's where I will get them from if I do ask, um, or once I ask, I should say. Um, we all introduced ourselves. I, the first question I'm going to put to the panel is, what attracted you to the law? It's, it's, a, it's a real left turn. I think for a lot of people uh, who, who with our back with our artistic backgrounds, I can tell you that uh, from you know, when I when I first during my first year of law school, I was catching up with my uh, room, one of my roommates from RISD, and he was so mad that I sold out and decided to get a real career <laughs> or a real career, as he put it. Um, he didn't talk to me for a year. I mean, that's how upset he was. Um, he thought I had betrayed my background. Uh, he later came around when he realized that this was really my calling and this is what I should have been doing all along. But um, Anyone can, who wants to go first? Yeah, I can, I can start us off. Um, I did not think about law school when I was at RISD. I, um, it was not something I thought about until after I graduated. I, as I mentioned, I graduated with a degree in photography. When I started, we were still in the dark room, black and white. By the time I graduated, we were all digital. And I did not feel like a career in photography um, with the way that the direction it was going was something that I would be happy with. And I also wanted something a little bit more stable. Um, I thought that was more suited to my personality, something that um, I would be using my brain in different ways and also give me an opportunity to make the art that I wanted to be making. And that's when I started to think about law school as that option um, and it's worked out perfectly exactly like I wanted it to for myself. Um, I didn't have grand ideas about being a trial attorney. I still don't. I, I'm not a lawyer like you might see on television, um, but I find that I like the stability that it gives me. It is an, an, a very alternate career path from RISD and not something that was, that was spoken about at all while I was there, um, but it's something that ended up being quite positive for me. Wants to go. Good, thanks. Um, I think I, I didn't think about becoming a lawyer. It, it was never even something that was in the back of my mind. I, I didn't know any lawyers growing up. I like still am one of the only lawyers that I know in like my family or, or friend circle, you know, aside from all the people that I met in law school, obviously. But uh, um, 
before I went to RISD, I actually went to both the University of Minnesota and, and NYU um, studying uh, an independent major, which was titled Creative Expression and Social Justice. So this sort of like idea of these two things tied has always been tied in my mind, but it wasn't necessarily the avenue that I wanted to go through. And I actually had almost finished my college degree before I entered RISD because I just realized I was getting lots of really good liberal arts training and really terrible arts training. And, and you know, it, it was always disappointing when you just put up a, a piece on the wall and your teacher goes, oh, thank you for just doing the assignment. You know, it's sort of like you had, you had no critical feedback and I knew that I wasn't getting any better at that, at that aspect. So that's when I went into RISD. But um, like everybody here, I think I, I left RISD and I moved to New York and took weird odd jobs um, as you do when you have a painting major. It's not like somebody's like, oh, this is the painting uh, job that you can have. So I, um, I worked for a while. I worked for maybe two or three, I suppose three or, three or four years. And I was also making my own work, um, engaging in gallery stuff, writing uh, a lot of, of um, shows up, you know, for like, I had a blog that turned into like, then galleries were contacting me. They'd be like, oh, thank you so much for reviewing this artist. Like, can we put that in their catalog? And so I started doing that sort of on the side. And um, I was also doing large scale um, mural painting, which was kind of like painting, but it's a Mountain Dew bottle as opposed to, uh, you know, anything that you'd ever want to do. It was like, uh, if, for those of you that have ever been to New York, you might see like the giant hand-painted uh, ads. That's, that's what I was doing for a while. But um, two things happened that, that caused me to decide to go to law school, which was um, first, I started selling artwork and I hated the experience. It made me feel really uncomfortable. I didn't like not being able to control necessarily where that artwork was going. Um, and then I'd use up the money to pay one month's rent and then I would just still feel bad about it. And then that was sort of it. So um, it was actually more the success of selling work that made me not want to be an artist more than like struggling to like to do that. Um, but at the same time in 2015, I was living in New York and that is when the first round of Black Lives Matter protests started and Eric Garner was killed, Mike Brown was killed, Trayvon Martin had been killed the year before, but, but um, George Zimmerman was acquitted that year and it's sort of all of this happened and I was working all day and then going to protest and organize all night and at a certain point I thought, I'm doing this the wrong way because I'm not even trying to, I don't even wanna be a working artist anymore. That doesn't feel like the way that I wanna make my money. I'd, I'd like to um, figure out a way to make money that feels less compromised, personally compromised and also um, invest the resources into something that I wanna do. So I went to law school um, fairly blind and I wouldn't recommend that. I'd, I'd recommend that anybody do a lot of research before they go to law school because I showed up not knowing anything about what the experience was going to be like and caught up, but it was not at all what I thought it was going to be. So that's, yeah, that's how I got into it. And, um, and now I'm working. <laughs> Sorry, I have two dogs. <laughs> anyway, Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, well, my story is, is um, pretty straightforward, right? It, it's the ability to make change, right? I think I'm, I, was, I was a lot like a lot of students, at least the students that I see today, in that I was angry and I saw um, a lot of racial injustice, a lot of issues um, surfacing in and around. I mean, this was, you know, ninth, when I was at RISD, it was partly 1991. Uh, that was Rodney King and other things were happening. And I grew up in a very socially oriented uh, household, but what, what I ended up studying in architecture and most of my projects were socially oriented. Battered woman shelter, community housing project, community pool project. My final thesis was a wetland water treatment facility. I just realized I became more interested in those issues and social issues, the social challenges that people were facing rather than the architecture itself. So I made the switch, but I, I think I must say that, you know, it, it really is we're going to get to the benefits of a RISD education, but I think, you know, if you're, if you're, um, if you're passionate about it, about the law and public policy, you'll find that it's the right decision. I mean, it's been, I've been so happy with it, you know, and I still love architecture and art and we'll talk about that too, but um, that's why I got into it. It was one of my I, goals. 
I think that's a great point. I mean, I, and Emmanuel, back to your point, um, you know, when I was m thinking about making that transition, I was, you know, it, it started kind of as a joke. What if I went to law school? And it was, it was not even like a real thought. It was a joke thought. And then the more I thought about it, I always say it was evolution, not revolution. Um, there was no one moment that felt like, oh, I have to do this. It was over time, over a period of time. And then it, it just became less jokey. And then when I said, this is a thought I can't ignore anymore, I, I started doing the research because I knew, you know, you hear the stories about how attorneys, the legal field has the highest rate of depression and has a high rate of like <laughs> suicide. It just, I mean, horrible numbers. And you're like, why would anyone voluntarily do this? And it was only after the research that I felt this is something that I can't ignore. I really need to pursue. And, you know, the difference between me and a lot of my friends from law school is that, A, I loved law school which is something that a lot of people don't, but I love being a lawyer, which is also something a lot of people don't. And it seems like we all kind of agree, at least more or less agree on that part. I don't want to speak for any of you. Uh, but, but um, you know, I, I think that for, that was, that was it for me. It was, it was, it was everything you've all said, but it was just that thing that you can't, that, that voice in the back of your head, you can't ignore and mm -hmm. don't ignore it. And actually, that's something I learned at RISD, which is great because it leads into my next question, which is how did RISD prepare you uh, for the law? I can start off again. Uh, yeah, if that's okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I love RISD. And even knowing now that I would go on to law school, I would still have gone to RISD. Um, something that I think prepared you for it is just that way of, of critical thinking, of looking at something and questioning what you see, questioning what intent is in, in something that you see. Um, and I think this goes back to something you just said, Greg, about love being a lawyer. I think that we are each all love being a lawyer in the ways that we are lawyers um, and sort of understanding the different ways to be a lawyer. I think it's understanding similarly to the different ways to be an artist. Um, there's law generally, and then there's the, the particular aspects of what you might do, um, but there are these general um, sort of principles that follow through. So I think RISD prepared me to be a lawyer and critical thinking is, is, is a huge part of it. Um, and sort of the ability to, to be comfortable in something new, um, something different, new ideas, new um, perspectives that comes through in my work all the time. And that's something that I um, sort of was faced with, loved being faced with daily, weekly at RISD and critiques. Um, with my fellow students. And I think that was a, a big plus, a big positive to succeeding in law school. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, first of all, I, I think that you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I, I think that's the biggest thing is the critical and analytical skills that go into to the education at RISD. I mean, and that what's so great about RISD is that it's not just the professors who you, you not only expect it from, but they, they exceeded expectations on that front, but also the students, right? There's a certain level of student that's at RISD, is passionate about their work, but really pressing you to make sure that the work that you do is justifiable, right? That you're not making sort of assumptions, um, that you have a basis for why you did something. And that kind of analysis is just right at the heart of the law and so I, in public policy generally. So I think the critical analysis is, is hugely important. The other thing I would say about RISD is that um, this, you know, the, the presentations that we had to do when we were at RISD, to stand up there and have to justify your work, talk about it in a very personal manner, but also again, to have to support it is something that a lot of students come to law school never having done. Yeah. And it's such, again, it's such an important skill. And I will end with one, with one point on this, and that's that I'm, I feel very fortunate in that um, I live in the same town as David McCauley. David is a, uh, he's a well-known illustrator and author and former RISD, he's a RISD grad as well. Um, but he said to me, the, the other, we were talking about this panel, and he said, almost verbatim, that's the thing about RISD, you can do anything you want with a RISD education. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly it, right? It provides so many important intellectual skills that many educator, many um, educational institutions do not provide. And it's just, so I can't speak highly enough about the critical analysis and the presentation stuff. So. Yeah. Well, sorry. Yeah, I, I would have to echo both of those points. I mean, I think oftentimes when I would speak to people about, you know, there's a fear 
going into law school, people have a, a tremendous fear of the Socratic method. And it's like, oh, clearly you've never put up something on the wall that you worked on all night, all day, the day before. And then all you're hearing is two hours of why it is terrible. Like, and then having to explain why it's not or having to justify it, you know? I had a RISD professor who once told somebody to put something in the trash, but not his trash because he didn't want anyone to know that it was made in his room. You know, like that is a terrible, like, oh, man. like teaching environment, like somebody asking you questions until you don't know the answer. That's just a breeze at that point after, after you've been a RISD. So I have to definitely echo that. I, I would say one of the things and I'm not sure if it's something that I learned at RISD, but something that was fostered and, and given a lot of credence at RISD was curiosity, because I think that as a lawyer, you often have to learn so much about something you had no no idea you have no grounding like half of it is just like every new case every new issue you just do a ton of research and you need to be really invested in understanding the ins and outs of everything but i don't know any artist that that's not their process anyway from from start to finish that they like get so focused on something and then they just go all in and then you know i mean i remember i don't know i don't think this was unique to painting but in painting uh, I remember the department sort of looked at painting loosely. So you could do whatever you wanted and call it a painting and then present it. And um, you'd hear about all sorts of different aspects of the world, everything that people are interested in, everything. And these, and people, I mean, people are um, so laser focused, I think at RISD because they know that people are going to be critical and they know that they're going to be, they're going to have to support their work and they're going to have to explain what's going on. And that is, that is really um, incredible. The other part of great creativity um, that is important is that is that so much of of a bad lawyer's practice is copy and pasting previous work and not actually thinking through the problem from the from start to finish and i and I've found even in the last two years that I've been working, I'll ask questions that to me seem really commonsensical if you just look at the problem and people people will often remark wait i've never even I've never even considered that and i and and I'm, it's not like I'm working with people that um are not well practiced or, or well respected in their field. And, and um, I think that that's, that's incredibly valuable to just be able, like Victoria said, to be able to see the world from a different perspective or just to challenge the first iteration of what you do is not the best thing that you're gonna do. And to know that you need to continue to dig deeper until you actually hit the good, um, the, the payload. And I think that that's true for making art. And I think that that's very true for making legal arguments or you know, things like that. Now. RISD didn't teach me how to write very well, but that's a, a different story, I would say. You know, I, I, I think these, I, all your points have been dead, dead on accurate, but I think that one of the things that I keep coming back to is that when, in my time at RISD was the volume of work, just, just more, I mean, every, every RISD uh, student alum has had at least one all-nighter, probably dozens, maybe hundreds, I don't know, it depends how, what, how you work, but we're all used to doing that 50 drawing assignment. And the truth is law school is, especially that first year, they give you more work than you can humanly do. And so much of what you do at RISD is A, become accustomed to the volume of work that you're doing. And that's one of the things that has stuck with me throughout my entire legal career. And especially once you, once you graduate law school, if you go to work for a law firm, those first, you know, maybe your entire law firm career is, spent just doing hundreds and hundreds of hours of work. And I think that training you get at RISD, while, while it feels grueling at times, it really prepares you for, I mean, in, in, its, in its own unique, perverse kind of way, for, prepares you for life as a lawyer because you, you can just do hours of work. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I once had a law school professor um, describe me as a workhorse, and I think that was a skill that I learned directly from RISD mm -hmm. of just, you know, not being daunted by the amount of work that needs to be done. You just do it until it's done. And, and you know, you don't feel stressed out about it. You don't have anxiety about needing to do it because you learn at RISD, you just do it and you do it all the way until it's done and then some more. Yeah. yeah. I, this re I mean, that really does tie into my, my next question, which was any connections between how you worked at RISD and how you work now. And that's my answer. <laughs> that's my answer, right? I just, <laughs> I just work and work and work the problem until I fall asleep. <laughs> and I wake up and I keep working the problem until it's done. Yeah. 
Well, I, I'll, I'll just build off of one thing that Emmanuel said. Um, it was interesting that you said that you're right. RISD doesn't necessarily teach you how to write, but I will say that, you know, I think there are a lot of parallels between the way I worked at RISD and the things that I learned about how to work, you know, how to kind of create projects and writing in the sense that I, I really kind of think of this broad context and what I want to say in a piece and kind of work my way down until I really continue to refine and refine it going back and back. And in many ways, I find that that's exactly how I kind of draw and still draw. Uh, but, but that kind of iterative process and going back and forth. And the other thing that I think at RISD, um, it, it's so important that you kind of learn at RISD, many times you learn the hard way, is feedback and learning how to accept feedback and criticism, right? I mean, RISD, right, is not for the faint of heart, right? But my gosh, if you, if you learn how to accept feedback, it's such a great skill. And I think that that's another really important th thing about the way I work now, and that's just feeling okay and, and, and being okay with being vulnerable about sending out an article and saying, what do y'all think about this? Getting that feedback and processing it, I think are really two big things about how, you know, how we worked at RISD and how I work today and late nights, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have, oh, thank you, Emmanuel. I have, um, my job is primarily writing and I agree that the, um, you know, writing as its own skill is not something that's necessarily honed at RISD, but the structure of what I write is very similar to the structure of the way that I was taught to think and really of the artist statements that I, I wrote while at RISD. Um, and that's something that is extremely helpful in my particular career. Um, I know how to organize information. I know how to organize thoughts. I know how to, how to um, explain my thoughts in an organized way that the reader is able to follow and, and understand what I'm trying to convey. And I think that's something that I had to do at RISD with my work, with my artist statements, and also just in speaking about my work um, during critiques. And that's something that's really come through, I think, and, and that's helped me in my professional legal career. Um, and then, of course, just the volume of the work, being able, um, Emmanuel, like you spoke also, being able to get up and speak, um, not being daunted by people questioning you, being able to articulate answers without getting flustered, of that sense of knowing yourself, of knowing that you've done the work, knowing that what you're presenting is true to what you intend and being able to defend it. And that's something that really comes through professionally for me. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I agree with both, well, with all three of you so far. I think that the amount of work, just the work ethic that you that is instilled is still the number one thing. Um, I remember compared, I, I think I was also a little older than the rest of the, my class in law school, so I'd like, also, I had worked a real job between, you know, undergrad and, and graduate school. And that I think has a huge, like makes a huge difference in whether you think that it's too much work or too little work. If you're already used to like a 40 hour a day or, you know, like work week, then it's not um, so bad. But one of the things that, yeah, one of the things that I was thinking about is, um, well, now it's escaped my mind because I, I was listening to you both uh, so much, but, um, well, it'll come back to me. I'll, I'll, I'll. No, I, yeah, I, I think everything you've all said, um, Victoria, especially what you just said about writing and how even though we're not taught to write at RISD, we're taught to sort of think through problems in a way that, that, um, that you know, it, it, it sort of hones your ability to think critically and to sort of structure and organize yourself so that you can write. I mean, I'm I never considered myself any great writer, but I find that write the process of writing, uh, you know, a, a legal brief, uh, a memo, a letter to a client or to a client uh, opposing counsel, um, it it follows a very similar creative trajectory that anything I did at RISD would have. So there, so and Jonathan, you mentioned um, the the honing the, that process, that honing process, and I, that that's you know, the refining process when you're drawing. And it's the same thing with my writing. It's the same thing with any presentations I'm giving. I do a lot of uh, public speaking um, for my for my day job. Um, and so it's just that, pro that process of working it and changing it and refining it. It's all the same. It's the same creative process. It doesn't matter what the product itself is. I... I I remember now the uh, thing that I was going to say. One of the things that I think um, 
I really have carried over, and I think into life generally from RISD, but is also evident in the work, is um, a confidence that if you do not know something, you can figure it out, which I think that a lot of people don't even tackle problems because they're so daunted by them from the beginning, you know, and, and a lot of a lot of law is really complicated and has lots of ins and outs and things that, that you know, would be um, flustering for any, anybody. I mean, they're flustering for most lawyers. And I think that um, my partner always says, you know, when she hangs out with me and my RISD friends, they're, she'll say like, oh, can you do this thing? And no one will say no. Even if they don't know how to do it now, they know that they will figure out how to do it by the time that they need to do it. And I think that that is very much true. You know, I don't get easily flustered by complex problems anymore because I know that they can all be broken down into smaller, easier to digest pieces. And, and right now I'm working on a lot of really, you know, someone will send me a patent. I haven't studied electrical engineering, but that doesn't matter. I, I know they're like, okay, I've done exploded drawings. I've done, you know, training in 3D. I've done all this like spatial reasoning, strangely enough, most lawyers are terrible with, and it's really useful if you're doing like all sorts of all sorts of different issues, especially like where was the officer when this thing occurred? And I remember um, even having a memo at law school our first year, uh, you get these packets, it's what they call a closed universe where they give you all the facts from a case and, and it was a police, um, a warrantless search case. And they gave us all these facts and whatever. And I said, okay, well the, the problem there's a problem already because just from the map that you've given us, there's no way that they could have seen this evidence from the door case closed. Like just being able to say like, Oh, from this piece of information, I was able to using spatial reasoning, which is something that I think that we taught were taught in at RISD that, Oh yeah, the problem is solved. And no one had ever, apparently they've been using the packet for 20 years and no one had ever said, Oh yeah, you're right. There's no vantage point from the door that they'd be able to see the evidence in the, in the living room. So I think that those things happen in real life too, where like the, the assumed, the assumed answers are that it's going to be in the intricacies and that if you have a different perspective, it's um, easily solvable. So that's one thing that came to mind. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, believe it or not, we're already at the halfway point. So I'm going to sort of transition a little bit. I'm going to ask you what advice for students considering a career in, in the law or public policy or any, even, even any other major career shift you would, you would provide. So Jonathan, let's start with you. Sure. Yes. So, I mean, I think it starts both sort of internally, but then externally, right? Internally, you just want to make sure you're passionate about it. I mean, the best attorneys that I've ever made met are the ones that are passionate about it. So um, th there's that. But then there's the, the sort of the reality of looking at the law and looking at public policy. And for that, I would really reach out to um, anyone on this panel, but you can certainly reach out to, to me, but I would also reach out to potentially um, counselors at law schools and speak with them. In some ways, it is still a buyer's market, meaning that students applying to law schools are in a really good shape. I will say that I would suspect that that is going to be excessively true this fall and even more true next fall, given a number of things that have happened in the world. Uh, and so I think you're in a good place. Um, and that will, that will be true also for the next couple of years if we look at the Great Recession and how law schools kind of work their way out of that. But thinking about, um, you know, applying to law schools and what that means and how to prepare for it, talk to lawyers, talk to friends. Um, one other point that I'll just make here is that uh, you're always able to shift, right? I mean, if you go into X law, you can always shift over to Y law. But thinking about talking to the person that you think has the job you want right now and just talking to them and saying, how did you get there? What's the trajectory you took? What are the things that I would begin to think about? Because, again, I, I, although I knew I wanted to go to law school after RISD, um, I was not prepared for, let's say, the LSAT. Um, and I was not prepared for what first year law school means. Uh, and I think that the, having that information would have been uh, I would have felt much better about the whole experience. Victoria, how about you? Um, I think Jonathan's, you know, made a lot of excellent points. I think um, it's important to know that there are a lot of different ways to be a lawyer. Um, and like Jonathan said, you can go into one area of law and then transition to another area of law easily. There are different ways that being a lawyer looks like. Um, I found for me when I made the transition, a lot of it was internally um, feeling like I wasn't an artist anymore because now I was doing something different. 
And that's something I would recommend, and Greg, you had mentioned that this earlier also, um, you are always gonna be an artist um, and don't be scared about choosing an alternate career path, about going to law school. Don't worry about what it means. If it's something that you feel passionate that you wanna do um, and that you feel like is gonna be a good choice for you, don't worry about what it means you know, as to you being an artist because you can do both, you can be both, um, you can be a whole person that has many different aspects and different facets of your personality and your life. Um, and so if anybody's thinking about that, that's something that I struggled with um, right after in, in my transition, um, sort of what that meant for my own sense of who I was and, and what I had intended for my life. Um, so don't be uh, scared for reasons like that. Don't worry about what it means as to your artistic self. Um, and then also for preparing yourself, I also was not prepared about what law school would look like, what the LSATs would look like. Um, I sort of just took the test and then just went to law school and then just figured it out. And it worked out favorably for me. I also love law school. Um, I, I succeeded, I excelled in law school, um, but that's something also preparation is gonna help you big time of having an idea of what you're getting yourself into. Um, and then when you graduate, also like Jonathan mentioned, if you can, find a lawyer that looks like the type of law lawyer that you wanna be, that practices the type of law that you wanna be, and you have an idea of what the appropriate career path is to get there, that's gonna be a big help for you. Emmanuel? Um, yeah, I think, that, I think that it is important that you are passionate about it. That's the number one advice. And I'd say like a, a piece of negative advice is if you're going to law school because you think you're going to make a lot of money, there are other careers where you'll make much more money and it won't be as hard and you don't have to do, you know, three years of school. And, and it's too hard if that's your only motivation, I would say. And I know too many people with it, that that was their only motivation and they weren't passionate about it. And, or it was something like they thought, I, I always wanted to be a lawyer, but that was the, the deepest level of commitment that they had to doing it. And, and even two years out, three years out, those people are miserable, you know? And so I would say, don't do it for that reason. Being an artist is hard. And being a struggling artist is hard. Perhaps being like a successful partner that you don't, but you don't like doing the law is even harder, I would say, because you're being worked to death and now you're not even making the things that you like and struggling, you know, like you're just struggling um, and you're not even enjoying the, the wealth that you might be <laughs> accruing at that certain point. So I've, I've already seen that happening with, with friends of mine where it's like that was their only motivation. And some of them have quit law already and now they're, both don't know what they want to do and they're in debt and it was just not the right decision. So that, that's a piece of negative advice, but the, um, I don't know. I have a different, I have a different experience than, than um, Greg and Victoria. I didn't, I didn't like law school. It was a really challenging experience for me. Um, I did well, but it was not a well, it, I didn't feel like it was a welcoming environment. I didn't feel like I aligned uh, very well with very many of the people that I had, but it was, it has to be something you're prepared to do despite whether it's a good experience or a bad experience. The law school part of it is three years of it. You want to be committed to the end goal. Like what is, what is the commitment that I really have beyond that? And I think that that, that was what was important for me to keep a focus on because I think that when something is really hard and when your commitment or your passion about it might not be that easy. I know a lot of people that started off thinking, oh, I really want to be a civil rights lawyer and I'm really committed and that's what I'm doing. And then it becomes like a competition. And if you have good grades, then this is the type of job that you get in. And, it, and it's a big draw. It's a big draw. A big paycheck is the big draw. I'm, I'm um, I, you know, I was born in Mexico. I came to the United States as a child. I grew up in poverty. Like a big paycheck is a big draw for me where nobody else in my family has ever had that. But like, I also know that if I went into big law immediately after law school, I would be miserable. You know? and, and I think that like being able to um, focus your, on your commitments to yourself and, and why is, what is the reason that I went here? That's, that's going to be incredibly helpful if you do choose to, if you do choose to go to law school. I, I, I have two points, which both piggyback on, on something that everyone also said, as well as myself, um, do the research. I think if, if it's something you're thinking about seriously, talk to lawyers. You, everyone knows someone who's a lawyer or knows someone who knows someone who's a lawyer. Talk to those people, ask them about their careers, ask them about their, their paths, 
why they chose law school, look into law schools themselves. Um, you know, you might be happy at one law school and miserable at another um, because different law schools have different, you know, environments, they have different cultures. And so I think you need to look into that, you know, figure out how much it's going to cost you in money, in loans, in lost income for the three years you're going to be in school. Um, do all of it, do rigorous research and figure out if this is really the path for you. I think, I think you're going to, you're going to have a much more successful transition if you do that, because even as hard as it will be when you make that transition and it will be hard, you'll at least have seen it coming. Um, the other thing I would, I would say, and I don't know if everyone here is going to agree with me, this might be controversial or it might not, but law school is a trade school. Um, if you, I, there's something I remember hearing a lot in my first year, which is you can do anything with a law degree. And that's true. You can do anything with a law degree, but it's a $200,000 degree. And it, that, I mean, unless you're independently wealthy, you're taking that money out in loans, uh, hopefully just federal loans, but I know a lot of people who took private loans too. And so it's e extraordinarily expensive. And if you don't want to be a lawyer, don't do it. I mean, if you, you can be a public policy person, you can be a professor. I mean, you need a, an advanced degree to become a professor, but don't go to law school to be a professor. Be, go be, get a master's degree and a PhD to be a professor. Don't, don't go to law school to be anything but a lawyer. You may not be a lawyer afterwards, but that's why you should go to law school. So that would be my, my opinion. I, I, yeah, I will take issue just with the last part. Sure. <laughs> well, I mean, especially with the public policy aspect, right? I mean, some of the greatest legislators in, in the U.S. history are lawyers. Yeah, that's true. Right? Um, and so, I, yeah, I mean, I think public policy might be a little bit different for, for your point, which for the most part I agree with, although I still think that there are aspects of, of that we learn in law school that are potentially applicable elsewhere as well. But I, I agree with the general premise that if you're not in it to, to become a lawyer, I, I wouldn't per perceive. It's an expensive endeavor. Yeah. The, so, the, oh, sorry. I was just going to, a little piece. The advice that I always give is if, if somebody asks me to become a lawyer, three times I tell them, oh, you should never become a lawyer. And if they don't survive those three times, then they were never meant to become a, you know, to go to law school in the first place. Like your commitment has to be greater than everyone telling you, oh, don't do this, because I think that that's a, a test of like, do you really want to? Right. So um, I want to ask everyone, what do you wish you had known as a RISD student that you know now? I wish that I had uh, sort of taken, I wish that I understood how difficult actually it would be once I graduated to have studio space, to have the resources to make art. You know, when you're at RISD, I, I don't want to say, I mean, maybe I took for granted or I just didn't really have the awareness of what amazing resources were at my disposal. Um, the space, the museum, the kilns, um, you know, for pottery. I mean, when I, now if there's anything I want to do, it is, um, I don't want to say an effort, but it's not effortless like it was at RISD, um, where everything was at your disposal to use. You can be as creative as you wanted to be without limitation over different areas of art and as, you know, once you graduate, that disappears. Um, so for the part of me that is an artist and that still makes art, that's something that I wish I had um, more awareness of and, and that I sort of was able to um, graduate knowing where the available places would be for me to um, go find a dark room, go find a pottery studio that used the type of clay that I liked and that could fire that type of clay that I liked and, and things like that. Um, as a lawyer, things that I wish that I had, um, wish that I knew at RISD that I knew now, just that my life would take me in different directions and who I thought I was when I was 19 is not who I am at 34. Um, and it's just, life is gonna keep changing, it's gonna keep you in different directions and who you are as a person, the way that you're going to be an artist, the way that you're going to be a professional is going to change. Um, and it's, it's, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, this is a this is a complicated question. I mean, there's many things that I wish that I knew at RISD that I know now, and probably things that I wish I didn't know. But uh, um, I think that one thing that stands out to me is just that oftentimes connections are more are the more powerful than your degree, and you need to let. And then once you get your foot in the door, you really need to. Like the only thing that's going to make you stand out from somebody else is to just work as hard as you possibly can, and that'll that'll that's your calling card. If if you think that because you have a RISD degree, you're suddenly going to get all the best like design jobs, and like the you're going to get a solo show in the first year, and you're like none of that happens. But when I moved um, to New York, I moved in with uh, two three roommates, and one of them was. Uh, economics major but he really wanted to be a photographer and one of them was you know like a, some other liberal arts major but he really wanted to work at galleries and the third one was a graphic designer and we all just struggled for years and then eventually I became a lawyer but now it's about 10 years later and you know they stuck to it and they stuck to those paths that they did and my roommate Brad Ogbana is now uh, really successful photographer my other roommate is now a you know working in, in museums as a as an art handler and and like leading that team and then the other one is a really successful product um graphic designer but i think it's like they all got there because they stuck with it and and it wasn't easy and and it like took a really long time and i think that there were so many people that i saw that would look to external signs of achievement you know they would say like oh but our our classmate has a solo show and i'd be like yes also like take one step back and say oh yeah they also their parents own that gallery you know like or whatever it would be but it would always measure yourself against like am i doing good work am i doing better than i was last year am i leveraging my like networks in in this way that and not not in like that gross way where you're like only networking for the sake of networking but is it like am i putting in the in the work i think that that's the most important thing because the people that i know that stop being artists that still want to be artists, it was just because they expected it to fall into their lap. It's a really hard job and it is a job. I think that that's the thing. You forget that it's not just the studio time, it's everything else is what makes it a job. The studio time is, is your studio time. That, that's what makes the work, but it's not, you know, you're gonna have to be on the phone a lot more than I think that you imagine, especially if you're, you know, in painting, I feel like people would be go off to their studios and just spend all day there. But that is not how you become a painter. You know, that's not how you, that's not how you do most things in the, in the world. So those are things I wish I knew. Yeah, and I'll just make two quick points on this. Two, two things I, I wish I knew. But one, the first one is very similar to what's already been mentioned. And that's just that um, try not to spend too much time, um, mental energy, thinking about what other folks are doing, particularly as you get older and you're thinking about switching careers or shifting in a career. Um, there are such great available options out there and to refine what you love and what you want to do uh, is I think a positive move and so to think oh my gosh I'm working next to this person who's 15 years younger than me and I what am I doing my, it's a lot of mental energy and just thinking about like what's important to you and changing what you want to do for your life I think is super important and I would say as a, as a student you know, you're kind of roped up in your own information and, and you don't see the bigger picture the second point I'd make is is similar to that, and that's just that when you're when you're um, you know when you're studying whatever it is that you're studying, you can be a, a biology major or more relevant, you can be a graphic design or photography major. Um, you see the system that you work in. And I think it's really important as for someone who wants to kind of make a shift to public policy or law that you understand that there's a system out there, and that system is is a body in motion and it's not going to stop right so i can scream and i can tell you how much i hate the lsat and i can tell you how much i hate the bar exam but it doesn't matter right there's a system out there and so if you understand that there is a system and then what that system involves and try to work within that system i think is oh, again something that i think i wish i knew because i did a lot of pushing against the system which is not healthy and doesn't help really you know, when in preparing for this panel, I wrote this question down three weeks ago, and I have to confess, until just now, I didn't know how to answer it. Um, and it wasn't really until listening to all of your answers that it sort of hit me. And in that, it's actually something that Victoria said, which is that um, 
being a whole person, right? I mean, when I was at student, especially once I picked my major and I was an FAV and you're ensconced in that world, you know, you're with your FAV people, or if you're in graphic design, you're with your graphic design people. And there's not a whole lot of um, socializing or connecting with people outside of your major, really. Um, you become obsessed with it. And for my entire RISD career and for years afterwards, I was, I'm going to be a filmmaker. This is my, my, not just my career, but this is my identity. This is who I am as a person. There was nothing outside of that that was me. And a lot of the stuff that I was interested in fell by the wayside. I stopped drawing. I stopped, you know, being invested in hobbies and, and that became my, who I was. And then as I transitioned away, I became lawyer man. I'm a lawyer. This is my thing. I'm everything about my identity is about being a lawyer about the law. And I was reading, you know, in my spare time, I'd be reading like SCOTUS briefs and I'd be, you know, I'm like thinking about and commenting on every possible legal issue in politics or in the law that would come up. And it, it, you know, I'm 40 and it took me until this year really to start thinking about myself as a person with multiple facets and interests. And I'm taking up hobbies that I gave up in my twenties and I'm enjoying it again. I was, I recently started drawing again and that's been a real um, amazing sort of rediscovery. So I would just caution, you know, everyone who's listening, um, don't let that happen. Don't stop being a whole person. You, you have, you can have interests that are not part of your career that are not part of the law that are not part. Of I mean, it's, it's hard when you're in law school because that does take up so much of your, physical and mental energy. Um, but don't stop being a whole person. So thank you, Victoria, for, for answering that question for me. We really have, we're coming down to the end of it. I have one more question with well, two more questions really for everyone. Um, originally I was going to ask how the pandemic, the coronavirus had, has changed your, um, your, has affected your work. Um, and there's some obvious answers to that, but I also want to sort of tack on the, the 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 protest, the Black Lives Matter issue. I know Emmanuel, I'm sure you have something to say about that. Um, you know, I, I imagine that these issues have affect. I mean, they've affected all of us, but I'd be interested in hearing how how the pandemic or the protests have uh, directly affected your work. And 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 by the way, how you see things changing for the future, if if at all. So Emmanuel, I'll start with you on that. Sure. I mean, it's been it's been a struggle over the last few weeks, and and like I told everybody before the panel started, I also grew up in Minneapolis, so it's it's very personal. And then I'm also working on policing issues, and it's very it, you know there's not really an escape from that. So I think that's a struggle, but that's not all the time too. It's not like very often that you have sort of a global uh, uprising and re rethinking of what the police mean in our society, especially when that's the issue that you're focused on. So, I mean, it was, a, it, it's both really challenging and then it's also a, a window of opportunity. And I, I was speaking with um, a professor of mine from UCLA yesterday. We, we had a long conversation and I said, I was going to be doing this panel. And I said, what do you, what do you think about this? And he's, um, he founded the, he was one of the founders of the critical race theory program at UCLA. And he said, well, for people like you that came for these reasons, you have, you have a new, a new world. That's, uh, you know, the, the baseline of what is acceptable discourse about these issues. He's like five years ago, people couldn't even comprehend what abolition means. Now every it's in the New York times front page. There's having op-eds in the debate. And it's like, it's a very different world that you're living in. Um, and law school is going to be exciting because of that. You know, I was, I was in law school. I went before Donald Trump was elected. I was there while Donald Trump was elected. And I remember, I think our, our um, class of critical race studies um, people or specialization, you know, class was maybe 12 people. And then the following class was 60 people. I think it changes the context of what you're studying, especially when you realize the law is not just contracts, but it's also, it's police use of force, it's Fourth Amendment, it's all of this informs everybody's daily lives in ways that they don't, I think, appreciate until something like this happens and then you go, oh wow, it puts it into really sharp relief. So I think for me, it's been 
it's been challenging both for personal and professional reasons, but it's also a, a challenge that um, I signed up for, you know, and I wasn't expecting it to like, I wasn't expecting like an uprising during a global pandemic, but you know, that's, uh, that's what we have. And, and, and maybe that's what allows for this moment of change. So um, it's, yeah, it's been, it's been intense. Hopefully. Jonathan, how about you? Well, it's obviously changed legal academia, much like many folks online understand academia, but I think more fundamentally, um, the particularly the social unrest, what it's sort of brought to the surface is uh, the implicit and explicit bias that is riddled throughout the law. Much of the world that I operate in is property law and land use, uh, environmental law, and it is almost hard to escape some type of discrimination embedded in the law in a way, one way or another, whether it's where we site hazardous waste, where we decide to take property for purposes of running roads, um, where are we locating our healthcare facilities away from certain districts, food deserts, food swamps. So there's all sorts of issues that are embedded in land use law and environmental law. Um, and, and I think that these conversations we're having now are, are bringing it all to the fore where it needs to be. I'll also note one last thing, and that's just that this again goes back to what we talked about with the RISD education, right? RISD education is is sort of like this critical analysis, right? Critical thinking, looking at the way we currently design our cities, design our suburbs, um, and looking at those laws and saying, well, what's the actual impact of doing this and how can we do it different? What are, what are the ramifications of looking at this differently? Um, and so, yeah, I, I think we're gonna see some real fundamental changes and we already are quite frankly in, in, in many of the land use discourses that we're seeing. Um, and then, you know, as for the pandemic and how that's changed, I've been working at home, um, but I work for the court. So that means remotely accessing a lot of confidential documents that are filed with the court. Um, I think this is going to be a big change in uh, the tech industry, actually, and what it means to have privacy. Um, basically, these Zoom meetings and um, on Skype holding uh, um, trials and hearings and talking to witnesses virtually is a big difference than doing it in person and that sort of show that you're used to putting on um, and then accessing these private documents. That's a, that's a big change and also e-filing a lot more. Um, that was something that the court had started to do and now that's just, I, I, I can imagine, I can't speak for the court, court but I can imagine that's something that is um, going to be much done much more going forward. So that way, if we're ever stuck at home again, documents can be accessed as opposed to unfortunately sitting and waiting for them to be uploaded. Um, you know, and then as for the state of um, New York or Brooklyn socially, I can speak to a little bit. Um, and I think the law, I, I think it goes to, I think the movement is extremely positive right now in terms of um, it really forces you to rethink the way that you think. And that is going to infiltrate the way that you think about laws and the way that you um, think that laws should be intended to be used. And I think that's something that is going to be very positive from this and is going to go forward um, and is going, going to inform um, how the law is used in different aspects and, and what the best practices are. You know, I've, I've noticed that, so, um, you know, in my, in my day job, we do uh, invest civil rights investigations as they pertain to housing. And um, we've noticed in the past couple months that there's been uh, you know, a pretty significant spike in people making um, allegations of discrimination on the basis of disability because of um, you know, they've been diagnosed with COVID-19 and all of a sudden they're not getting callbacks from you know, prospective landlords. So, um, so we're seeing that kind of thing. But what's interesting too is in recent weeks, we started seeing um, a, a spike in, in discrimination claims on the basis of race, color, or national origin. And the reason that's unique is that in New England, historically, there just aren't a lot of those types of discrimination claims. So, you know, if, if you're, if you're a, a black prospective tenant looking for housing, for, for whatever reason in, in, in our region, there just hasn't been, haven't been that many people willing to come forward and make claims on the basis of racial discrimination. And we're starting to see a change in that as well. Um, you know, on, to on top of the normal changes, you know, the adjustments of working from home and trying to, 
deal with class, you know, sensitive information digitally and make, you know, because some people are using their personal computers, they don't have work laptops, so we're trying to work around those issues. But I found the, 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 the increase in racial discrimination claims has been really unique. And, you know, it sounds weird to say this, but uh, hopeful, because it means that people are not keeping that to themselves anymore. They're actually starting to feel comfortable coming forward and making those allegations, which is something they haven't been in the past. So we're, we're at, in my day job, we're excited for that. In my night job, as, as, a, as a practicing attorney, I've, I've also found that clients have become more um, easier to get in touch with. And I don't know, maybe just they're all working from home as well. So I, I used to always have problems getting clients to call me back and now they're doing it. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. Um, it's eight o'clock. We have one more question, a question I already answered. So I'm gonna ask all of you, are you still doing art? I can, um, I can start. I am not every day, not um, every day with a passion and not one thing in particular all the time, but I do life drawing. Um, I do pottery and it's something that I do when the desire, when the interest is there and it's a beautiful um, creative experience. It's not something I do when I don't feel that way. It's never something I have to force, um, but it's something that I, I'm very fortunate to be able to do and that I I love to do when I'm able to. Emmanuel, how about you? Um, I don't have the space for painting. I don't have the space and I don't, you know, like with painting oil, I, I would oil paint. So it's like, it's too much of a mess to like put out for right, you know, I've got half an hour now to do some oil painting. I, I don't have the space for that, but I am, I am drawing some on occasion. I've found that I do more um, writing, which, is similarly, I mean, it, you know, it's hard when you write all day and you're like, oh, just knocked out 40 pages, let me write something personal. But I do, I do, do more writing as like a creative um, pursuit and, and um, I feel that that's like pretty, it's been pretty nice to have that outlet. And like Victoria, I don't feel, I don't feel the need necessarily. I, I have more of the desire than, than like a guilt or anything that I'm not doing it. And, and I also recognize like, Sometimes you worked, you know, 80 hours that week. You just, I don't, I don't even feel like doing a drawing. I don't feel like doing anything like that. So um, off and on, it, it goes in, it goes in waves, I would say. And, and I try not to be judgmental about that. I would like to be doing it more, I would say, but I also became a lawyer. So I don't know what I'm thinking, you know? So. <laughs> uh, yes, I do. I still do a fair amount of drawing, but it's, it's mostly because it's a great activity for my children and I. I have two daughters and, and we do it together. And it's just such a great way for us to get outside and sketch trees, rivers, whatever they want to sketch. Great. So we're, uh, we're at the end of it. Um, so um, before we go, uh, I'm gonna give my email address and I'm gonna type it into the chat screen here so people can see it there. It's Greg at the Legal Artist, G-R-E-G at the Legal Artist, T-H-E-L-E-G-A-L a r t i s t dot com, again g r e g at t h e l e g a l a r t i s t dot com. If you have specific legal questions, you can ask that ask me. Um, if you want to get in touch with any of the presenters and ask them more about their careers and their you know advice they may have, non legal advice that they might have, um, uh, you get in touch with me and I'll I'll put you in touch with them. Um, this is, would also be a great time if you have any questions. Uh, to type either into that chat box or the Q&A box. So I'll give everyone a chance to do that now. So I'll give you all a minute. But at the, at the same time, I, I would really love to thank our panelists, uh, Emmanuel, Jonathan, and Victoria for taking time out of their schedule to come and do this. I hope you got a lot out of it. Um, I actually got a lot, of, a lot more out of it than I thought uh, I was going to. It turns out we, we all have very similar perspectives on the matters. So um, that's great. So anybody have any questions? Oh, okay, here's a question from Amy, who is one of our, um, our members. Hi, Amy. Um, it's, she says, hi, everyone. I was wondering if folks are still in touch with their RISD friends or professors. Um, I'm not in touch with any RISD professor. Actually, that's not true. I'm, in I'm still kind of in touch with one, uh, Peter O'Neill from the FAV department. I am in touch with um, uh, a number of friends, roommates, from RISD. And I've actually, as I've gotten older, reconnected with them. 
partly because we all have kids and so we're connecting on that front. Um, how about you guys? I'm, um, I stayed in touch with um, my closest friends from RISD and those friendships have to continue to, to develop and we're spread out across the United States and they're great uh, reasons for us to travel to California, to travel to different places and to see each other. And that's been great to see what everybody's doing and to have that shared RISD experience. Um, I haven't kept in touch with RISD professors except for Instagram, um, you know, the likes and the follows and the comments. But other than that, um, I've not been in touch with the professors. Um, yeah, I, I, some of my closest friendships are with people that I met at RISD um, and have continued to develop over the last uh, decade. And um, I'm actually going to go out of town tomorrow with two people that I went to RISD with. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a great place to keep, it's, especially if you're a lawyer, it's nice to have friends that aren't lawyers and that you can like, because lawyers, when they get together, it's fun and it's nice, but then it's like, it's also obnoxious it's, at some points. You forget, like that, that bit about being a whole person is not occurring if you're just with a bunch of lawyers, I think, <laughs> you know, like talking together. Um, and I have been in touch with a few, a few RISD professors, not that many, but um, I've gone to speak at one's classes several times where it's in the, it's in the painting department and it's um, for, you know, a professional practices class or something like that. And, and I'm always trotted out as like, what if you fail as an artist? You know, <laughs> uh, so I've, I've given a couple of presentations to his class, but it's funny, I, I run into them in New York, other, other professors, because so many of them commute from New York, um, especially at shows. If you go to people's shows and things like that, you'll run into RISD professors, mostly adjunct professors, not full-time professors. So, um, yeah. Very similar story. Yeah, it's the same thing. Some of my closest friends and some of my most dearest friends are the ones that I made at RISD. Uh, we have another question. Uh, hello, where would you recommend beginning your research into law? You know, that, I think that's a difficult question to, to answer. Um, you know, research into law, if you mean um, the different types of ways to be a lawyer, TV <laughs> is a good resource for there um, to see how they're, they're portrayed. Um, also, just talking to lawyers. You can go to your local courthouse um, when things are open, if you live in a state where they're open or if you live in a state where they're currently closed when they reopen. And you can sit in a courthouse and you can see the cases that come in. You can um, listen to what's going on. These are open public spaces. You can see the lawyers that come in and you can get a sense of what's going on. Um, and I think that's a great resource for somebody who really needs that first step into what's going on, what does it look like, what is this all about to go take a look and see. Uh, I would say, I mean, it's similar. First, the, the big question at the outset is, what do you mean by research into law? Are you talking about um, a specific area of law? Are you talking about looking at whether or not to go to law school and researching law schools? I mean, if it's about law schools, then I would look at a couple different resources. Um, I would start maybe with some things like the U.S. World News and Report ranking, just to get a sense of who's doing what um, and what has which school has strong um, programs. Also look at a, a website called Above the Law. It has yeah. some really interesting things about just the uh, legal academia generally. Um, and as well as uh, the ABA journal, uh, the American Bar Association has a journal. You just kind of pick it up, flip through it. There's some short articles in there, some longer ones, but just kind of get a sense of what legal academia looks like. And then just like uh, Victoria mentioned, I, I would, I mean, reaching out to lawyers is fantastic, but I would also reach out to a law professor. And if you don't know any, you're more than welcome to contact me. Yeah, I would, I would echo both those things. I think Google is always your friend. So, you know, do some great searches and then you'll find some great answers. But um, the other thing that I would say is that, and piggybacking off an earlier question about things I wish I knew uh, at RISD is that I, the legal profession tends to foster great mentorship. Like I've, I've not met a lawyer that I've reached out to that hasn't been excited to give me everything that they knew and help me along the way. And I've tried to do that. Um, I had somebody reach out to me last week saying, I wanna be a lawyer and I sent them an email. Okay, what's your timeline? This is your timeline. This is when you should be thinking about the LSAT. Like, let's talk about, you know, what your range is, where you were trying to go to law school, all these sorts of things. And then we went over her first practice exam over a Zoom meeting. Like I, 
I mean, I'm not saying that every person's going to give you that amount of detail, but um, more than any other profession that I know, people are so willing to mentor strangers or just even have coffee with you and like sit down and have an hour long conversation about it and, um, and are not afraid to, you know, talk to complete strangers because I think all of us remember how difficult it was to do this, even if we had a lot of information and, and are happy to pass that on. So I would say, I would say do that. Yeah, lawyers love to talk. So um, asking lawyers to talk to you um, it will never will, will never fail. Um, I, I you know I like our, our, some, everything that everyone already said. I would say it's it can be difficult when you're not in law school to get a sense of what a given area of law looks like. I can tell you from personal experience that when I transitioned into law school, I was convinced, like absolutely convinced, I was going to be a prosecutor, and. Um, I did three internships in prosecutor's offices to get a, a, you know, really to build my resume so that when I graduated, I would have been hired by a, a DA's office. And working in that environment made it pretty clear to me that it's not something I wanted to do. Um, largely for me, it was because that, you know, being a trial attorney was uh, very similar to being a television producer. There was like 20% of it was really exciting and 80% of it was harrowing and time consuming and it would, have, it would have given me a lifestyle very similar to the one I had just left in television production. And it's not something I want to do, but it's not something I really knew about until I saw it up close. And so it can be very hard to know about specific areas of law. It's tempting to look at, say, to say something like environmental law and say, yeah, I care about the environment, so I want to be an environmental lawyer, but I think you need to be around it uh, to some degree, and it's hard to do that before law school. Um, and actually, this actually ties into the next question that came through, which is, is there a way to find some employment or experience in one of those fields like land use or civil rights law pre-law school? And again, at least in my experience, it, it is hard to do it, but not impossible. Um, but that, that's something I'll put back to the panel. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It, it, well, I think I'm not sure about the hard part. I mean, it just depends on um, how much legwork you're willing to put into it. Yeah. But I mean, it, it, when we talk about land use or environmental law, we could be talking about state representatives doing public policy. We could be talking about nonprofits. We could also be talking about law firm kind of classic attorney kind of stuff. So I think reaching out to, to any and all of them, um, but I think you're more likely to find something pre-law and maybe the public policy arena, which is, a, I think, a great place to start and to get some really interesting uh, experience and helpful experience to kind of answer many of the questions that Craig just raised. I agree. And, you know, as, ter as far as internships, that's something that's going to be um, easier once you're in law school, because the places that are going to have those internships are going to want law students rather than students that are pre-law. Um, but actually, I think that if you want a paying job, uh, that's not, that doesn't require a legal degree, um, but in an office or in an area that where they practice the type of law that you might be interested in, um, I think that's something that's, uh, that you could certainly go look for pre-law school. Um, you know, at the courthouse, for example, there are a lot of people that work in the clerk's office um, or that do sort of administrative work, sometimes part-time, but are there pre-law school to sort of get a sense of what happens in the court, what's going on. Um, and to see all these different filings, all these different types of lawsuits that come in before they go on to law school. Um, so, so don't think of only internships, actually think of paying jobs that are not necessarily careers, um, but that are something that you could do before you go to law school in the areas that you want to be in. Yeah, I would, I would echo those things. I, you know, at the Brennan Center where I worked before, uh, our our intern class was maybe like 100 summer interns and some of them were undergrads and some of them were, you know, law students. That's strange. That's not the typical sort of thing, but a lot of places will ha house two or three undergrad interns and then one, you know, legal intern and something like that. And if you're still in at RISD, but this is something you're interested in or would just like a feel for, I would apply for those things and, and say, you know, these are my interests. Um, and then there are like like Victoria said and and Jonathan said public policy is a good a good place to go um, because you can get a paying job and they have jobs that are sort of like are you thinking about going to law school 
here's a job that you can have and it's a limited one year position and you'll, you'll get paid and you'll get a lot of experience and, and um, you know, so like a lot of research assistants, you can, you can get jobs in uh, public policy places. Um, if you're in DC, there's a ton of jobs in this, in this area. Um, so I would just look, look for a field that you're interested in, you know, and, and look at the organizations and just go on their employment page and see what's on there. It takes time, but um, it's well worth investing that time. And you'll have a leg up if you do go to law school. If you, if you... One, one quick idea, and I, you know, I, I have no idea if this would actually work, right? But you know, because RISD is in Providence, and Providence is the state capital, um, you know, looking at who, what the committees are in the, the state legislature, going through the committees and identifying who the, the chair and the vice chair of the committees are, reaching out to them and just saying, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a student at RISD, and I'm um, looking for 15, 20 hours a week, whatever it is, to intern for, for free, maybe credit. I don't know if you can get credit for that at RISD, but for free, um, is there anything I can do for you? I mean, at the, what's the worst they can say, right? Is no, all right, can I get a coffee anyways? Well, coffee these days, but um, you know, I, so I, I, think, I think there's opportunities even across the river from RISD. I, th I think these are all good points. I would, I would it just actually struck me, um, if you, if you know, if you have a good sense of what it is you want to do, um, I can, I think there's probably lots of, like, for example, if you're really into government work, the federal government, the state governments often have like undergrad fellowships and one year grant programs that you can look into. That would be really great for uh, experience. It's, it, you know, it, I, theoretically, if you wanted to get a sense of what law firm was like, law firm life was like, you could get a job as a, as a legal assistant or a paralegal just to sort of, and I, and I know several uh, attorneys who took that route, who started off by testing out life at a law firm before they, you know, took the plunge and went to law school. So there are always those kinds of things. Um, it is almost 20 after eight. So I think we're going to have to wrap it up. Uh, again, I'm just going to put my email out there, greg at thelegalartist.com, G-R-E-G at T-H-E-L-E-G-A-L artist.com. I put it in the chat function as well. Uh, thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, this is a really great conversation. And I'm, it's unfortunate we have to stop it, but it, we have to stop it. So thank you. Uh, good night, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.